Hi, Bashar. I know you good day. Um, a couple of years ago, in one of the transmissions, you responded to a question about gravity with yes. the copper ball experiment. Yes. In the copper ball experiment, it was a demonstration of this notion that location is a property of every object. Correct. I've been thinking about that every day since. Oh, moment. all right. And I want to talk about some ideas that came out of it. Uh, by all means. But first, I want to review the experiment so that all of us can do this together. Is that is that all right? Yes. Okay. The experiment is this idea. Many of you already understand how our ships travel from star to star because we treat the idea of location as not a place an object exists in, but as an actual equational vibrational property of the object. So that an object existing here and then existing here are actually literally two different objects. Because when you change the locational variable in the object here and impose upon it the idea of the energy of the locational variable of this location, the object must by definition cease to exist here and immediately and instantly exist here. And thus no travel in the intervening distance has actually occurred. The object has simply popped out of one reality and pop back into the reality somewhere else based on the new locational variable that you have injected into its overall vibrational signature equation. So the experiment to begin to practice this, to learn this principle, is to have a very, very flat table, very flat, as flat as you can get it, and at least six to 10 of your feet long, and have a very, very thin, as round as you can make it, thin copper sphere. Then you have the ability to extract from that sphere, either by striking it or through some other methodology, the actual tone, the signature frequency of that pure, very thin shelled copper sphere that is hollow. When you extract the tone that is the signature frequency of that sphere, and then move the sphere to the other end of the table and extract the tone from the sphere there, location B. Then move the sphere back to location A. Then in any way you can with your technology, either acoustically or electronically, amplify and magnify the vibrational tone of location B, but bombard the sphere in location A with the vibrational tone of location B, and you will begin to watch that the sphere will start to roll to location B automatically with that vibrational tone. And once it arrives in that location, will stop and go no further because it has found its resting point within that vibrational equation. That's the experiment. Fascinating. That will begin the ability to investigate how to really unlock an object from one vibrational locational reality and in that unlocked state impose upon it enough energy of the new location to have it actually pop out from location A and pop in at location B without actually just traveling from one point to the other. Make sense? Yes. All right. What really stuck out with me was the idea that it traveled slowly and it I made me wonder about gravity in general. Yes. If, first of all, there's two things that emerge from this experiment. Number one, if a vibration can be detected, it must be radiating from every object. Of course. That means that the location of all objects in the universe radiate their location. Of course. That's how we create the navigational charts that our ships use to go from place to place. Because once you understand the matrix of locational vibrations in a relatively limited area, it's relatively easy to extrapolate that out to the rest of the universe. Right. I assume there's a graduation of frequency that yes. relates to location. Yes. Secondly, in a sense, it's turning the entire universe into the understanding of a rheostat. Right. The other the emergent idea that comes from the experiment is that objects will take on frequency and thus move to the location representative of that frequency. Yes, because it's representative of that object in that location. I understand. Isn't that exactly what gravity does? I mean, right now our yes. scientists talk about gravity in terms of warping space and thus objects. And in a move sense, through. from one perspective, that isn't incorrect but it's not the whole picture. You're still seeing just the side effect of the relationship right. of frequencies with each other. 
and the relationship of geometry with itself in certain patterns. Like, let's take a massful object like a, a neutron star, a highly dense collection of mass. Yes. It has a highly coherent gravity wave radiation because yes. there's a lot of matter in one area. Yes. That radiates out, and any object in its vicinity takes on that frequency, and, it, and as such, it, it's drawn in. Yes. So that's the mechanism of gravity, isn't it? Yes. That's it. It it's is just re-identifying the locational variables within objects because it is powerful enough to do so. Right. It's it powerful enough to the... overwhelm the idea of their initial locational signature. And the objects around, like a sun or a star or whatever, yes. they also take up the vibrations of those yes. around them and they wobble around a little bit. So, so it's this an interactive is, exchange. Yes. Fundamentally, it is an exchange of information. That's what gravity is. I knew it. <laughs> I, well, congratulations. I've been thinking about this every day. And now there's another component. I mean, we also have this concept we've seen called time dilation, frame dragging. Objects that rotate yes, yes, yes. planets have... Yes. Well, that's very dilation. simply explained. It's part of the vibrational emanation is temporal, isn't it? There's a temporal... Component. Well, yes, but time is a side effect. But if you want to really look at it in the simplistic way, the most simplistic way possible, since you already know it's just space-time, it's really one thing that has expressions as space and expressions as time, yes? Right. So just look at space-time as the 100% thing. Look at it as a sliding scale. If you're at this end, you're experiencing, shall we say, less space and more time because you're not moving. You understand? Yeah. But if you go to this end, you're experiencing the idea of less time because you're occupying more of the space by moving. So anytime you move, you're using up the space component and not leaving enough room for the time component. And therefore time seems to slow down because the whole picture of space time has to always equal 100%. So if you're occupying space 50%, time has to slow down 50% because there's no room for it to be moving at 51% if you're occupying 50% of the space by movement. Mm -hmm. So it's really totally just a 100% thing. And depending upon where you are in the sliding scale determines how fast or slow or how much you experience of space and time. Does okay. that make sense? It does. All now, right. Let's have a little fun with this. Oh, all right. I thought we were having fun, but go ahead. Let's have some more fun. <clears throat> we talked about some things coming up and I want to open the door to that. In all terms right. Of technology. Yes. Yeah. If we were able to detect gravity waves, I don't. I know we can't really quite do that. Right? Actually, you already have. The high-frequency gravity waves, is that what it is? Your scientists have recently conducted an experiment where they have, for the first time, confirmed the existence of gravity waves. Yeah. One of my clients is working on that. Yes. Well, so are many others. Yeah. Um, the problem is we don't really have the... The what? Detect, well, the we what? can't detect it outside of the background noise, so there's a discrimination problem right now. We understand, but that's a challenge that you will have fun solving. Yeah, it's deliriously fun. Um, <laughs> well, that is convincing. <laughs> I want to just put out a, a proposal for an electrogravitic propulsion system. Yes. If we could detect gravity waves, say, a forward area of a, of a ship. Yes relay that data to the center of mass of the ship, yes. amplify it, modulate it, yes. impart it to a center of mass, wouldn't that result in forward movement along the vector described by the center As of long mass? as you also impart the idea of less behind the ship, so that you're riding a wave like a surfer. Again, scientists are already working on this on your planet. Yeah. Okay, so that would work. Oh, yes, absolutely. Your scientists already understand, at least some of them do, the true beginnings of what you have colloquially referred to as a warp drive. Right. You just don't quite have the technology for it yet, but the principle is sound. What is the nature of these waves? What, what would be the best way to start really detecting them with, with assuredness? Like really well, as soon as you understand that the relationship within gravity is an informational exchange and that a locational variable is part of that, then you will begin to understand how to use gravity and how to alter the information in a way that serves you. Is it an electromagnetic? I mean, you talked about vibration. Well, electrogravitic, if electro you wish to put it that way. 
The other thing I, I'm intuitively sensing is that it, perhaps it has a multi-dimensional component. Always, in other words, of course. There's a, we were in third density, but I sense that it's a fourth density wave that has third density effect. Actually, it's much higher than that dimensionally, but it does filter down through the dimensions, and in your dimension, this is the effect you get. So in order to really start getting into this, we have to have a fourth density detection At least system. a fourth dimension or fifth dimensional, actually, understanding of it so that you can utilize what is happening in your fourth dimensional reality. Right. And would it be, would, when I've looked at hyperdimensional physics, it, it tends to be that these quantum leaps in frequency domains. Yes. So to, to get into the fourth density detection, we have to get to a higher level of frequency. Right? Yes. And then that gets filtered down into third density as like a... Yes, but you're moving into fourth down. density. Do you understand the difference between density and dimension? Yes. All right. All right. So you're moving into fourth density, but you will remain in physical reality in fourth density. The idea is that you already exist in fourth dimensionality because you have three dimensions of space and one of time. Okay. But you need to allow yourself to begin to understand the properties of fifth dimensionality to truly understand from a higher point of view how to relate to and translate the way in which these things translate or filter down into the lower dimensions and go from your understanding in fifth density so that you can utilize this understanding in fourth density. And this is why we urge and encourage all of you to really work with your higher mind because your higher mind already exists in the idea of fifth density. Hmm. So seeing these things and understanding these things from the perspective of your higher mind will allow you greater understanding in your physical reality experience. Can we detect the higher dimensional frequencies by, by looking at the lower harmonics? Because I think that we can You can get them. hints yeah. that they're there, whether you can detect them directly or not, but you can certainly get side effects that let you know they exist, even if you cannot have a direct detection. Okay, so that's the starting point. That's the starting point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.